starting. Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the EVOS seminar series. Our guest today is Dr. Jessica Hua, who studies toxicology in amphibians. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave the intro at that, and I will let her take the stage. Hi, everyone. This is actually really interesting. I think this will be the first uh, virtual lecture that I've ever given. So it's strange. I see your faces in the bottom. Um, so that means if, I, if you have any questions, you just wave at me and I should be able to pick that up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch it over to my screen share. And that should allow you guys to see the PowerPoint presentation that I put together. So again, uh, I plan on only speaking for about 45 minutes and then um, I hope to leave plenty of room for, for questions. All right, so I will share my entire screen. All right, so... We will begin. So what I have right here, so actually I lied, I, I can't see your faces. So if, if anybody has any comments, um, if you don't mind, feel free to interrupt so that I actually know um, that you, do. you have questions. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you. All right. So I, I've labeled this talk, Poisons, Predators, and Parasites, Integrating Environmental Complexity into Toxicology. So. Broadly, uh, my lab, we're interested in understanding what human populations do to aquatic ecosystems. Now specifically, I know that's broad. We're interested in chemical contaminants and, and what they do. In my lab, we have people working on all sorts of chemical contaminants, things that come from agricultural runoff, so things like pesticides, pharmaceuticals, so antibiotics that people use in livestock, to also things like road salt. So when we're thinking about these different contaminants, oftentimes the first step in, in trying to understand what they do is to start with these short-term single species tests. Now these are, these are fantastic in that they really do help us understand what uh, the direct effects of a contaminant are. But if you can see in this image, these are, are fairly simple studies. So you have an organism, a single organism, and a petri dish. Now this is an issue because when you think about nature, nature is way more complex. And if you want to understand what things like agricultural runoff or road salts actually do, you really need to think about adding ecological complexity. So pesticides, road salts, is not the only stressor. What does LC50 stand for? Ah, I will get to that. It is okay. lethal concentration 50. And so basically at this point, what I want you to know is that these, these tests, these traditional tests are, are fairly basic. But in nature, Organisms experience other stressors such as parasites, you have other stressors such as predators, and then also invasive species. And so um, how do we understand the effect of contaminants when you integrate in this ecological complexity? Now in addition to ecological complexity, organisms can also potentially evolve pollens, bless you, to chemical contaminants. So uh, a major theme in my research lab is how can we integrate complexity, but more specifically, can we incorporate what we know from ecology and evolution into our understanding of toxicology with the goal of better understanding the impacts of contaminants? So um, with that goal in mind, I've broken up this talk into three sections. The first will focus on ecotoxicology. My goal will be to demonstrate the importance of, of integrating ecology. So why should you care about ecology if you're interested in contaminants? I'll focus on road salts for this work. Uh, what I've done is I, I basically put together all the road salt work in, in my, my research lab, and I'll show you our approach at understanding contaminants. So it's a hierarchical approach. We start simply with single species assays. And then, as I mentioned before, you can't just consider, or you shouldn't just consider individual species on their own because we know that they exist in communities. And so in this section, I'll talk about if you incorporate this ecological complexity, how might it change the effect of road salts? And then finally, in addition to considering species to species interactions, another factor that might influence the effect of road salts might be the, a shift in abiotic conditions, so things that aren't living. So how might shifts in water quality impact the, the, the effect of salts? So in this first ecology section, uh, I'll talk about three different experiments. Then I'll transition to a, a fairly brief section on uh, why we should also consider evolution. And again, I'll advocate for 
why evolution is important in toxicology. And, and what's interesting is I think very few people are, are, are doing this currently. And, and I think that a major theme in the lab is to try to push for this because I do think it's important. And I hope that I can demonstrate why it's important in this section. Lastly, a lot of the work that we do has very applied implications. And so uh, we think that it's very important to be able to communicate this to broader audiences. Uh, specifically today I'll talk about how we have tried to address this question. How can art facilitate science communication? And I'll tell you a little bit about our Wild Waiters program and, and how we've done this. So four sections, um, or three sections, uh, we'll start first with single species and road salts. In this slide I want to give you a little bit of context on why you should care about uh, salinization. In the northern areas of the U.S., of course, it's pretty, pretty apparent when you spread road salt on the ground. Um, it's important for road safety, but uh, when salts run off, they can, uh, they can cause increased salinization of freshwater ecosystems, and this can be uh, dangerous for freshwater communities. But it's not just a, a northern issue. Secondary salinization of freshwater ecosystems can occur globally. Um, you can think about things like uh, coastal flooding, uh, this can increase salinity levels. You can think about things like agricultural irrigation, which can also increase salinization. So um, while we may think that road salts are an issue, it's actually something that is widespread globally. Uh, this work is done by Nicholas Buss. I also tried to highlight all the students that are involved in, in, in these studies. So the first two sections, um, Nicholas Buss is uh, responsible for the research. So for context, I, I kind of wanted to provide a little bit of information about uh, what salinity levels you might expect. In freshwater at Binghamton, we have around a 0.4 grams per liter salinity level. When you get to brackish estuaries, so this is the, um, the border between fresh and, and, and seawater, it's anywhere from one to 10 grams per liter. And seawater is actually fairly consistent at about 35 grams per liter. So um, for, for reference, in a recently published study, the Cary Institute found that in wetlands that are next to roadways that are contaminated by road salts, you can get up to 4.8 grams per liter. Now this is, this is uh, it's pretty substantial. I mean, these are freshwater wetlands that fall into the range of brackish estuaries. So uh, the point is, I, I feel like this is, uh, yes, this is the worst case scenario, but it's something to pay attention to. And specifically for us, we want to understand, well, what does this mean for freshwater aquatic organisms? And Maximus, this gets back to your, your, your question of what is an LC50? So an LC50 is a, a tool that toxicologists use to understand how toxic something is. It's fairly simple. You have uh, petri dishes with organisms, and you expose them to increasing concentration of your contaminant, as you might expect. Higher concentrations will, will cause higher mortality. So what we can do is we can, we can graph this, this figure or, or this response. On the x-axis are the concentrations. On the y-axis is survival. You might get a curve that looks something like this. Then we go to the concentration of the, the contaminant that kills 50% of your organism, and that's the LC50 value. Now, what's really useful about the LC50 value is you can run this uniform assay across a diversity of different species, and in doing so, you can compare in a uniform way how toxic a chemical might be to different species. So that's how you could figure out how toxic salt might be. Now, the challenge is when we think about wetlands, the diversity in wetlands, is, it's, it's incredible. And so to, to handle this, what toxicologists typically do is they, they use models. So here is a water flea. It's meant to be a model for invertebrates in wetlands. So it should predict how toxic salt might be to things like aquatic insects or, or parasites, what you see in that, that rectangle there. And so for reference, the LC50 of water fleas to salt is about 2.4 grams per liter. Roadside wetlands can get up to 4.8 grams per liter. That means that at about 2.4 grams per liter, we lose about 50% of our, our invertebrates. That would mean that if this model accurately predicts what would happen in the roadside wetlands, we should see a, a dramatic decrease in the invertebrate populations in these wetlands. Similarly, we can look at vertebrate models. This is the a minnow. Uh, the LC50 is about 7.7 .7 grams per liter, and these represent vertebrates such as amphibians. And here, uh, because the LC50 is above 4.8, what you would find in roadside wetlands, 
we might predict that that vertebrates should be safe even in conditions where there's increasing salinity levels. Now, one thing I do want to say is keep in mind that we're, we're really looking at high levels. 4.8 is a concentration that is what we call worst case scenario. So how toxic is salt to freshwater aquatic organisms? What Nick did was he went out and he collected species, um, six different species that are very commonly found, and he just conducted the, the basic LC50. And what you see underneath are the values, and, and you see that they, they range from 0.34 grams per liter to 10.4. This is an incredibly large range. What does this mean? If they were found in roadside wetlands, these three species would be um, susceptible. So you have the trimatode, wood frog, and spring peeper. Um, and I think at this point, what I want to do is turn your attention back to the invertebrate model. Is this invertebrate model an accurate um, predictor of what we might expect? So it says 2.4. What I find surprising is that um, this invertebrate model is meant to represent the most susceptible species and the least susceptible species. And so the point here is that if you're thinking about the trimatode, the invertebrate model grossly underestimates how toxic salt might be. But if your perspective is on the dragonfly larvae, it completely overestimates toxicity. And so the point is, um, invertebrate models, while they're great in helping us give get an initial perception of how toxic salt might be, it, it's, just, it's just not enough when you have such a wide range of diversity. Same thing for the vertebrate model. It's great in predicting the results for leopard frogs and American toads, but when it comes to wood frogs and spring peepers, it's not quite as accurate. So for this section, the main take-home message is that model organisms are useful but I really do believe that toxicologists need to, to consider the diversity of organisms. It's not enough to just focus on, on, on the model. And, and what it boils down to is, what do we protect? We may lose two amphibians, the wood frog and the spring peeper, but does it really matter if we still have leopard frogs, American toads? Same thing for the trimatode. What does it matter if you eliminate trimatodes, a parasite? And so I think to answer that question, it's absolutely critical that toxicologists consider the ecology of these organisms, how they interact with each other. And, and that actually transitions to the second part of this talk, the multi-species portion. So I've talked a lot about what we called that, that worst case scenario, but in reality, most ponds aren't next to roadways. A lot of them are further away and oftentimes experience lower concentrations. And so in thinking about this, um, they may not be exposed to these large concentrations, but they're also exposed to a variety of different stressors. So if these low concentrations don't hurt them or kill them, can they still change the way that they um, deal with other stressors? And in this case, what I'll be talking about it when I say stressors are parasites. And so this is the work that uh, Nick wanted to pursue. Um, he, and when I say parasites, he's interested in trimatodes. This is Echinoporiferum lineage 3. Uh, if you look at the, I think it would be your leftmost photo, that's a snail in a, uh, a container. All those little dots are the parasite. They're the free swimming stage. They emerge from the snail. They find the tadpole. They swim up the cloaca of the tadpole, and then they insist in the kidney tissue. And when they're in the kidney, this is an important organ, of course, for osmoregulation. So in that final photo of the tadpole, you see um, a wood frog that is bloated. And it's, the reason is that because the trematodes are in the kidney, it affects osmoregulation and the symptom is bloating. So using trematodes and wood frogs as his model, what Nick did is he asked first, how do low concentrations of NACL affect susceptibility to trematodes? To do this, what he did was he used wood frog tadpoles, exposed them to four different concentrations. So these are much lower concentrations of salt. These are sublethal. And then exposed them to 50 trematodes. He counted how many of the trematodes successfully insisted in these tadpoles. This is what he found. On the x-axis here, you see NACL concentration. On the y-axis, average number of cysts. Um, first, I'll show you zero. These are tadpoles not exposed to any salt early on, and, and you see that anywhere from 12 to 15 get into the tadpole. But for tadpoles that were exposed to the NACL, it didn't matter what concentration they were exposed to. 
the concentrations, exposure to sublethal um, NACL increased tadpole susceptibility to tumor toads. So the point is, we don't necessarily always just need to worry about the lethal concentrations of salt. Though these, these low concentrations, they don't kill the tadpole, they can still have devastating effects when they have to deal with other stressors. So from here, um, Nick actually took it a step further. Most people think about hosts and parasites and, and, and that interaction. But hosts and parasites are also embedded in more complex communities. And so with these results that salt increases their susceptibility to parasites, Nick wanted to ask, well, what about if we complicate or we add complexity to this, this interaction? If you add other members of the community, such as these predators that you see on this slide, how does it modify this effect of salt? So what does he think about this? We know that uh, predators can modify behavior of tadpoles. This is a dragonfly nymph. It's a really voracious predator of tadpoles. Um, uh, we can look at what they do in this figure to your right on the x-axis. There are two treatments, no predator, or um, a dish with just the smell of the dragonfly nymph. So this is just a dish with water containing, um, with water from the dragonfly nymph cage. What you see is the smell of the predator causes a reduction in tadpole movement by about 46%. Why should you care about this? Movement is important for trematode avoidance. So what you see in this video here is the tadpole avoiding the, the parasite, the cercaria, it's doing a flip. Here you see an invasive, evasive movement. It's sw swimming and then quickly there's a, a burst of speed. So because movement is important for trematode avoidance and because dragonfly predators reduce movement, the prediction is that if you add this complexity into the ecosystem, they should increase tadpole susceptibility to the trematode. In contrast, you have also parasite predators. This is a damselfly nymph and they consume the, the parasite. Nick found that damselfly nymphs reduce parasite abundance by uh, about 68%. And because of the reduction in abundance, we would predict that if you have damselfly nymphs in the, in the uh, arena, they should decrease tadpole susceptibility to trematodes. So uh, with all of this together, what Nick did is he exposed wood frog tadpoles to no salt or salt, and then exposed them to the different predator treatments, no predator, damselfly, dragonfly, or both. And he did this for tadpoles exposed to salt and not exposed to salt then exposed them to 50 trematodes. And similar to the last experiment, he counted how many of these trematodes successfully insisted in the tadpole. So the data slide. On the x-axis, the predator. On the y-axis, um, the average number of cysts. In blue, these are tadpoles that are not exposed to salt. In red, those that were. For the no predator treatment, Nick replicated his findings. Those exposed to salt were still more susceptible to parasites than those not exposed to salt. For the parasite predator, the prediction was that these parasites should consume, or these parasite predators should consume the parasite. So we should see a reduction in the average number of cysts. Nick found that, and what is interesting is that still you find that exposure to salt caused an increase in susceptibility to parasites. For the host predator, the prediction is that um, they should change the behavior of the tadpole, causing them to stop moving, which makes them more susceptible to parasites. And so we should see an increase in the average number of cysts in the tadpole, and we do see an increase. And also what we find is that now the effect of salt is gone. This is important to note because um, here we, we, we show the first evidence that uh, when you consider certain species or certain predators in the environment that added complexity, uh, it no longer is consistent with our original finding. For the parasite and host predator treatment, we predicted that it should fall somewhere in between. They should cancel each other out. Parasites should eat the parasite. The parasite predator should eat the parasite. The host predator should reduce movement, and, and they, we do find that it is somewhere in the middle. So collectively, um, in this study, Nick found that low doses, while not lethal, can still have negative effects by increasing susceptibility to parasites, really highlighting the need to, again, consider ecological complexity and how we understand the effects of contaminants. Second, predators modify this effect. So it's not enough to just look at host and, and parasite in isolation, but really we need to consider this interaction in more complex, realistic communities. 
So um, the conclusion, and this brings me to the, the end of the, the, the first part of the ecological complexity issue, we need to con continue to incorporate ecological complexity. I've talked to you guys so far about integrating species-species complexity, so biotic variables. But another way that another thing that can affect toxicity of, of salt would be shifts in abiotic conditions, so non-living conditions. One way that um, abiotic conditions can change is through water chemistry, water quality. And this happens at the interface between terrestrial communities and aquatic communities. In other words, when you have terrestrial communities dropping in their leaves into aquatic systems, it's, sort of, it's kind of like a tea. It can affect the, the water chemistry. And here I just have an image of uh, a green frog, frog that we found just chilling in, in uh, leaf litter water. And uh, what you can see is that um, this leaf litter can really dramatically change the abiotic condition. Now, what we're interested in are anthropogenic effects. So you have basically native trees that can alter water chemistry. But more and more, you also have things like invasive plants that are coming into wetlands that can really change what goes into wetlands um, from terrestrial systems. So invasive plants often have secondary chemicals that protect them from herbivores. So it's one of the things that make them more competitive than the native plant species. They also may contain other um, chemical makeups. They may have different levels of calcium, magnesium. And so the first question I'll ask here is, does the shift from native plant species to invasive plants and terrestrial communities alter water quality and chemistry? And if it does change water quality and chemistry, how does that shift? And how does that shift in quality and chemistry affect amphibians and their response to NACL? So um, one thing I want to highlight is that this work is completely done by undergraduates. It was a course-based undergraduate research experience. It was a collaboration between these members of my lab, so Jared and Sean, Devin, my, my graduate student, and uh, members of the NVI481 plant ecology class with Dr. George Mindel. So um, we worked together to um, ask, does a shift from native plants to invasive plant change water quality and chemistry? To do this, we collected leaf litter. So we went out to the nature preserve and chose three native species, cattail, blueberry, and steeple bush, and then paired them with invasive plants that were found in similar areas. So cattail was, was uh, paired with common reed, blueberry paired with autumn olive, steeple bush paired with purple loosestrife. We collected leaf litter, put them in uh, kiddie pools, and created one gram leaf litter per liter of water solution. So um, you can see uh, what this might look like in this slide here. Um, we had six plant treatments plus the filtered water control. And then we measured a variety of different water quality um, variables. So we measured pH, dissolved oxygen, temperature, turbidity. And then we also measured various metals that we knew were important to amphibian development and amphibian susceptibility to other contaminants. We measured alkali, alkaline metals, transition metals, and also heavy metals. For the sake of this talk, we didn't find any, any heavy metals, so I'll focus on just the, the, the pH, um, the, the, the first three bullet points that popped up here. All right, so to do this, we allowed the pools and the leaf litter to soak for 28 days. And in this first image, you see what, how different the pools look from cattail to common reed. For those that are data inclined, what we found was a decrease in dissolved oxygen, an increase in, in turbidity as you went from native to invasive. Uh, when we look at blueberry to autumn olive, these are what the pools look like. And again, um, what we do find is a consistent decrease in dissolved oxygen and an increase in turbidity. Finally, from steeple bush to purple loosestrife, these are what the pools look like. Again, a decrease in dissolved oxygen and increase in turbidity. So overall, we find as you go from native and invasive, a decrease in dissolved oxygen. What this suggests is there's increased microbial um, activity. But we should also note that this uh, increase in dissolved oxygen isn't something that is necessarily a negative thing. It's well within the range that species can handle. What was really interesting to us is this increase in turbidity, this consistent increase. What is turbidity? What is turbidity? turbidity is how dark the water is. And so what you see is it, it truly does get dark visually from the, the native to the invasive. And so we were interested in 
understanding, you see this increase in turbidity, but what is leaching into the water? What is making it so turbid? So we looked first at the alkali, alkaline metals. Um, what we find is we find a slight increase in potassium, a slight increase in calcium for cattail to common reed. We find the same pattern for uh, blueberry to autumn olive, increase in both of these metals. And then also an increase in both of these metals as you go from steeple bush to purple loosestrife. So um, we see an increase in the alkali, alkaline metals. I know this is a lot of metals now. I'll get back to why we should care about these increases in, in uh, a few slides. So we know that uh, we see increases in these types of metals, transition metals, same thing. Increase, not, not quite significant here, but the trend throughout is an increase in manganese and also an increase in iron. So um, we know that there are metals leaching into the water and, and some of these things might be what is driving how turbid the water is. And so with that, we can take the next step. So we now know there are differences between native and invasive plant species. How does it affect amphibian developmental time? How does it affect their susceptibility to NACL? So just to bring you back to the main goal of, of this process, we want to not only consider how ecology and species interaction shape amphibian responses to salt, but also how changes in abiotic conditions, such as those heavy metals that I brought up, affect susceptibility to salt. So we filtered this water. We wanted to remove the leaf litter through a 250 micron net. And, and this is what we ended up with. And using this water, what we did was we chose two amphibians, a native leopard frog, an invasive African clawed frog, and we exposed them as embryos to these different, uh, basically, leaf litter water. We measured first to understand development, how this leaf litter water affected their time to hatching. And then once they became tadpoles, we wanted to know how susceptible they were to NACL. So we measured time to death by exposing the tadpoles to 10 grams of, uh, per liter of NACL. So how does being reared in this different leaf litter water affect your susceptibility to salt? later in life. I'll start first with developmental time. On the x-axis is plant species. Um, on the y-axis is time to hatching. In yellow, this is what happened to the leopard frog. What we found is that as you go from native to invasive plant species, there's a decrease in developmental time. Now, one thing I wanted to note, uh, just for simplicity, there are three native plant species and three invasive plant species, but I just combined them um, in this slide. For the African clawed frog, what we found is that they did not change. African clawed frog hatching was not affected by invasive litter. So it seems like this invasive amphibian was fairly tolerant to changes in water chemistry from native to invasive. What about susceptibility to NACL? Uh, same x-axis. On the y-axis now, you have average time to death. Um, just to orient you to the y-axis, um, when there is a higher average time to death, that means they survive longer. So they're less susceptible to NACL, and when there's lower number, they're more susceptible. For leopard frogs, we found that the shift in water chemistry, or this change from native to invasive plant species, caused a decrease. So they became more susceptible if they, were, if they grew up in invasive leaf litter. But what's interesting is for the African clawed frog, we found the opposite pattern. Those that were reared in invasive plants actually ended up being less susceptible to NACL. And so here it sort of suggests that invasive plant litter facilitates these African clawed frogs. Now from here, I want to bring you back to the, the chemistry. So what was leaching into the water? The, the ones that we were most um, interested in were potassium, calcium, and manganese. We see an increase in all of these uh, various metals, and we should care, and we think that these might be uh, drivers of the patterns we found because we know that in the literature, increases in potassium can lead to decreased developmental time. And if you remember, we found that leopard frogs um, in invasive leaf litter grew faster, they developed faster. What we found here are, is that you have increased calcium can decrease susceptibility to other contaminants, so it can protect organisms from the negative effects of other contaminants. But manganese, if it's greater than 0.1 milligram per liter, can increase susceptibility to other contaminants. So here um, we, we have potential mechanisms for what might be driving the patterns that we find. This is something that we hope to, to follow up on. Um, what we would do is actually manipulate these elements and uh, see if we can replicate our finding. In this way, we could see what might be driving the patterns we see. 
But overall, I, what is important in this finding is that we find evidence that suggests that is uh, consistent with uh, the invasional meltdown hypotheses, which basically suggests that the presence of an invasive species causes a stress that facilitates other invasive species, which are better able than native species to handle stressful environments. But um, the key to this finding is that we didn't find it unless we considered the interaction with NACL. And so um, the main point is that uh, by considering changes in abiotic conditions, we have a completely different perspective of what salts might do. So to bring this entire ecology section to a close, um, again, the goal is to show that uh, while these single species assays are, are really useful in helping us understand very quickly how toxic a contaminant is, hopefully I've showed you that as you increase in the complexity, the ecological, the abiotic complexity of a, sy a system, it changes the way we understand what salt might do. So ecology is important. But at the same time, um, in this section, I'll talk very briefly about why we should also consider evolution in toxicology. So when we think about evolution, perhaps the best studied phenomenon is the evolution of pesticide tolerance in pest species. You know, it's, it's not all that surprising. Um, we know that uh, this costs us a lot of money for pest evolved tolerance. I mean, we lose tons of crops because of this issue. So we know a lot about evolved tolerance in pests, but what is surprising is that we know that contaminants also get into freshwater ecosystems. So when they get in, they can affect non-target organisms that live within. Yet we have a much more limited understanding about how these organisms evolve tolerance to pesticides. Can they evolve tolerance? And if so, um, what are some of the, the costs associated with evolved tolerance? And those are the two questions that I'll address in this section. First, is there evidence for evolved tolerance to pesticides in non-target organisms? And then if you're allocating resources towards being tolerant to pesticides, how does that affect your ability to deal with other stressors? Are there costs dealing to, to other, to evolving tolerance? So to do this, we, we focused on um, wood frogs as our model organism. And one way to look at uh, evolved tolerance to ask that question is to follow the wood frog across multiple generations. Of course, that can take many, many generations, so um, to save time. Another method to look for uh, whether there's evidence of evolved tolerance is to use a space for time substitution. This is fairly straightforward. You can take populations along a distance from agricultural gradient, um, those far from agriculture, so the boxes represent populations. Those far from agriculture are not exposed to pesticides as often, those close to, uh, compared to those close to agriculture. And so we might predict that because those populations close to agriculture are exposed to pesticides, that maybe they have evolved tolerance to pesticides. So if there is evidence of evolved tolerance, we should see this pattern. Those populations far from agriculture should be less tolerant to chemicals. Those populations close to agriculture should be more tolerant to chemicals. To do this, um, we went out to 15 populations of wood frogs, collected egg masses, brought them back to the lab, reared them in common conditions until they became tadpoles. And then we exposed them to a lethal concentration of carbaryl. This is a very common insecticide that you can just go to Walmart and pick up. And what we wanted to do is ask, is there evidence for evolved pesticide tolerance? If there is, we should see those close to agriculture being more tolerant than those far from agriculture. On this y-axis, um, more tolerant up top, less tolerant on the bottom. On the x-axis, distance to agriculture. What we do find is a significant negative relationship. Indeed, those close to agriculture were more tolerant to this carbaryl than those far from agriculture. Importantly, we also find that there is variation in amphibian susceptibility to this carbaryl, which then allows us to ask, well, if there is variation, if there is evidence of evolved tolerance, what are some of those costs? What uh, Vanessa, my graduate student, um, ended up doing is that she thought that the costs of being tolerant might manifest itself when these wood frogs are dealing with other stressors such as parasites. So she went back out to these 15 populations, collected them, when they became tadpoles, she exposed them to either zero or 50 trematodes. This was the same parasite we, um, that Nick worked on in the first section. And then she also exposed them to zero or 10 to the third plaque forming units of ronavirus. Uh, ronavirus is an emerging infectious disease. Um, it can be really devastating to whole populations. Uh, many people liken it to 
the Ebola for amphibians, it causes things like hemorrhaging, uh, bloating, and so it's often highly uh, lethal to wood frogs. So um, she has populations that are susceptible to pesticides, has populations that are tolerant to pesticides. How does that um, affect their susceptibility now to parasites? We'll start first with trematodes. On the x-axis, um, I have uh, a gradient. To the left are those susceptible to pesticides. To the right, those tolerant to pesticides. What she found is that there are actually, in this case, no cost of being tolerant to pesticides when it comes to trematode infection. Those that are pesticide tolerant also had the lowest trematode load. And what's interesting here is we, we think that one explanation for this is that those that were pesticide tolerant are from populations that are close to agriculture, which also um, experience a lot of nutrient input, which facilitate the snail. Remember, the snail is the first host of the parasite. So when you have more snails, you have more parasites. So it's possible that those that are tolerant to pesticide have also evolved tolerance to parasites because they're, they're likely exposed to them more. Something, again, that we hope to find a mechanism to moving forward. What about ronavirus? So um, x-axis is the same. Y-axis is ronavirus survival. And as I mentioned before, wood frogs are extremely susceptible to this virus. What you see is very low survival, and we find no relationship between how tolerant they are to pesticides and ronavirus survival. But what we were able to do is, as we were able to measure another variable, which is ronavirus load, this is just how many, how many viral copies we found on the tadpole after death. And what we see is a significant population. Here we do find a cost of being tolerant to pesticide. Those tadpoles from populations that are pesticide tolerant also had higher viral loads. So to put everything together in this, uh, in this evolution section, it's, it's a, the shortest section, but I, I, I still thought it was very important to bring up that it's not enough to just consider ecology, but evolution is important as well because these organisms, wood frogs, can evolve tolerance to pesticides, which is a, a really optimistic uh, thought when it comes to thinking about these um, contamination events and, and wood frogs may be able to handle them. But we really need to think about costs as well, ecological costs. So while they are able to respond to pesticides, there, it is costly to them when if ronavirus were uh, present, but interestingly, not trematodes. So here again, um, this is an intersection where you can consider evolutionary responses, but it's not enough. You has, have to also integrate back in that ecology. So with that, um, I am to the final section of this talk, the wild waiters. And in the next uh, six to, to seven minutes or so, I'll talk about um, why, why we're doing this. Uh, I think what really drove this is the current climate. There's a lot of mistrust of science, and, and many people argue that this mistrust of science is due to the fact that a lot of Americans truly don't know what scientists do. Um, I, I love this beautiful, um, this, this movement of the actual living scientists, and the goal is that people would submit photos of themselves, scientists would submit photos of themselves, trying to demystify what we actually do. Um, this is inspiring to us as a lab. So we put together something called the Wild Waiters Program. Um, the goal is to sort of communicate what wetlands are to the general public, why they should care, some of the threats that wetlands face. Uh, we do this through a variety of different programs. Um, we, we think about things like uh, educating K through six um, by doing next generation science standard lesson plans. We've implemented them. I think that uh, it's really cool to see how excited kids can get uh, when they see wetlands, wetland creatures. We work with people from Achieve New York. Uh, this is an organization that provides enrichment to adults in the area with various mental disabilities. We provide wetland animals, and it's one of the coolest things to, to see reactions to these wetland creatures. Um, it's, all, it's almost always one or two ways that I either love the animal or it's an instant, like, this is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen, um, which I really appreciate, um, just the, the true response there. We have things where we, we bring wetland organisms, allow people to, um, to uh, view these different organisms, and the thought is that this would allow people to appreciate wetland organisms, and if they appreciate it, then um, they might be more willing to protect them. And then we've been working with the local PBS channel. 
to um, develop videos um, about ecotoxicology, disease ecology, and our hope is to integrate that into some of our classroom work. But today, um, I actually want to talk to you all about uh, some of the work that Benjamin McLaughlin has been doing. Um, he is interested in addressing this question, can art improve public perception of research? And to do this, uh, what Ben has been doing is he has been creating art shows. Um, here are just a few images of some of the artwork that he's done. This is just a fraction of the art that, that Ben has done. And, and you might see that they're all uh, wetland themed, disease ecology, toxicology, very similar to the research that I've been talking to you about. He's created two art shows. He's invited people to visit the art show and, and to uh, fill out surveys. And in 2016, he was interested in his survey was interested in asking how uh, can art improve public perception of research. In 2017, he, he sort of wanted to go a little bit more in depth to how does art improve public perception of wetland conservation. Um, overall, we've had a total of 255 total participants and um, in the next few slides, I'll talk about what we actually found. So here on the x-axis, this is the first study. We wanted to know how art improved public perception of research, and we focused on major of um, the, the students involved. Y-axis um, is the change in perception. What we found is that after visiting the art show, people that were non-science majors actually had an increase, uh, a positive increase in their perception of what research was by about 20%. Science majors had an increase, but it was a little bit less, a 10% increase. And for those that are specifically in the ecology field, we found absolutely no change in perception of research. And so what this suggests to us is that um, uh, we really should focus our efforts. This art show was an incredible amount of effort. So, so because it took so much time to be most effective, we really need to focus on the, the non-science um, folks. And uh, really, I think also what drove this pattern is that those in the ecology field, there was an ecology art show. They already appreciate ecology research, otherwise why would they be in this field? And so the change in perception really wasn't all that much because they already started with a higher level of appreciation of research. So um, with that, uh, we can look at the data from the second um, experiment. Here, uh, we, we broke it down to be more specific. We, we gave um, the participants um, three different areas uh, that we wanted to test. The first was we wanted to understand their knowledge of wetland conservation issues. So we gave them three comments. Uh, I have a strong knowledge of wetlands. Wetlands are threatened. Chemicals I use impact wetlands. And we, told them, we asked them to agree or disagree with these statements. So this, uh, this first finding I was encouraged by. Um, most of the participants started with a not so strong knowledge of wetlands, but we see an increase after participating. So in red is after the art show. Many thought that wetlands are threatened, um, but this increased after the, the art show. Fewer thought that chemicals they personally used impacted wetlands, but still this increased after the art show. The next set of questions asked about how they thought about impact of wetland degradation. Uh, there were two uh, components here. The statements were wetland loss affects plants and animals, or wetland loss affects me. And what was interesting is that most people recognize that wetland loss would affect plants and animals, but it would affect them personally. But after going to the art show, uh, it was encouraging to see that this, this, uh, this uh, sentiment increased. So they, they agreed more that wetland loss affected them personally. Finally, we, we asked questions about uh, contribution to wetland conservation. Who is responsible for protecting wetlands? Should it be the government? Should it be them personally? Or um, and if, it is, should, if it is them personally, how much would they personally donate in dollars to wetland conservation? So before and after, most people thought that the government should protect wetlands beforehand, and it was definitely not their responsibility. But after the art show, you see an increase in um, them personally thinking that they should contribute. So I thought that was a positive impact. But what's funny is when you look at the dollars that these students would actually donate, so on the y-axis now, this is uh, the upper part is in dollars. We see absolutely no change in act how many they would actually contribute. And so um, what this, this, is, this is interesting, um, and we think that this might actually also be driven by the fact that uh, our, our uh, target audience were students. So we, we actually had to throw out uh, a few of the, um, 
the, the model or a few of the, the surveys because you would get answers like I would donate six ramen packets, for example. So the hope is that eventually we will um, also target other uh, uh, demographics. So um, in this section, we, we found art can improve perception of research, but it was more effective for students without science backgrounds. And then art improved participant knowledge of wetland issues, impact, and willingness to contribute to wetland conservation. So I should also note, I say, can art improve public perception of research? But it should really say, can art, uh, can, can outreach with art improve public perception of research? So with that, uh, I know this is a lot, so I want to bring it together so that you have um, short chunks to take away from this talk. In the first section, I talked about ecotoxicology, why you should consider ecology. I demonstrated that laboratory assays, while they're really useful, they're just not always effective when you have, when you're thinking about the diversity found in wetlands. In the second section, I talked about why we need to consider species interactions. We found that low concentrations of salt may not be toxic, may not be lethal, but it can affect amphibian susceptibility to parasites. But we also need to consider more complex communities because predators modify this effect. Um, leaf litter from invasive terrestrial plants we found may facilitate invasive amphibians. So considering ecosystem level abiotic shifts in water quality can shape how we understand uh, the impact of salt on amphibians. Evotoxicology, we found that wood frogs can be tolerant, which is a really optimistic um, finding to pesticides, but it comes at a cost. Uh, they were more susceptible to rhinovirus, but not more susceptible to the trematode. And finally, for science communication, we found positive effects in, in using the art show as an outreach effort, but we really need to focus on those without science backgrounds. So with that, there are so many people to think, thank. Um, the, this is my research group here. A lot of um, undergraduates and graduates worked very hard on these projects. And also, of course, I um, definitely want to thank the funding sources that uh, were, were important to making this, allowing for this research to go on. And um, at this point, I'll stop. I'm going to turn it back uh, away from screen share and would be happy to, to answer any questions that, that you guys might have. All right. So turning off screen share now. Yeah. yeah. OK. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, yeah, so I'll start, I guess, with something somewhat general, which is like you, you gave us so many studies, right? And, and you've got, you've got all of these different results. And one of the themes of, of, of your, of all those results is like, oh, it gets complicated. You have to, you have to take in mind like this interaction and this interaction and this interaction. But like the, the methodology that we use as scientists, like you got to focus on, like, okay, here's this one and here's this one. And here. so like, then you, you get, you get this like bundle of facts basically. And then what, what do you do with, with those, you know, oh, well, you know, if, if there's a random bias, you know, like all of these like little contingencies and like, how do you, what do you do with all of these facts once you've, once you've outlined this very complicated network? You know, that's, that's a great question. And I think the, the reason, I, I think it boils down to the state of the field. So right now, where we stand is we have all these simple assays. And, and that's what drives our regulation. That, that's what drives how we're protected from, from these chemicals in the environment. But what we're realizing is it's, it's not enough. And so by doing these, these studies, the first step is to show where it matters. And then we need a lot of those types of studies to show in more complex scenarios. And then once we acquire those studies, then we, then we have the ability to pull out generalizations. But until we actually do those studies, I think it's, it's impossible. I, I don't think at this point I can, I can make recommendations about, oh, there's not a virus, you have to do this, this, and this. But I think where we stand is we need more people to do these types of studies and make these efforts so that we can get there. We can have data to then have modelers, for example, people with math skills that I don't have, make predictions. So the goal, the goal, the goal is in the future for, for this to, to become data for somebody that can use it to regulate. So where is um, Just to clarify, sorry, my name's Kenise. Um, so these were tested on... 
Hi, how are you? <laughs> These were tested on fresh water species and salt water species? No, just this are all. No, just this are all. Okay. Yeah, so it's even, yeah, so it's even more scary. Um, scary. Um, hmm, we have some audio problems. Let me see. We have some audio. <laughs> okay. I, so I, I think it was, I, I've muted Kimmy, so okay. I'm sorry about that. There's some technical. Yeah. Problem. Um, I, what I was I was mentioning is that I think it's a it's a big issue because these are all freshwater species, but the problem is that these freshwater wetlands are becoming um, affected. The, 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 there's an increase in salt levels through the, all the issues that I pointed out, and unlike other contaminants like pesticides, which are designed to break down, when you get salt into your wetlands, they're not going anywhere. They're not breaking down. They stay there. So it's going to be a continually increasing issue. And so the question is, what do these? Well, what is it going to do now? But really, what is it going to do in the future? So I, I think that's a great evolutionary question because are these organisms going to evolve increased salt tolerance? Is the entire community just going to shift to like a like a inland salt marsh? That'd be really really interesting, I think. Are is there? Is there any long-term data about that, like tracking biodiversity shifts in, in some of these like now now urban areas compared to when 50 years ago they weren't? Um, you know, I, I don't know about that. I know the Cary Institute has been doing a lot of that. Um, I think that uh, generally it's just not really an issue that people pay too much attention about. I mean, you have to think about also, like we, we need to salt our roads. Like how are we gonna get around in the winter, right? Sure, we can, at this point, I, I really do think that we can come up with a solution, uh, an alternative solution to salt, but um, it's, it's hard to tell somebody, to tell a city, you can't salt the roads because of wetlands, right? And, and I, I think, I think uh, it, it's, it's gonna be something that, um, uh, it's gaining a lot of attention at the very least. Uh, yeah, someone wanna go? Yeah, I, I just kind of a specific question. During that earlier uh, experiment where you had the predators, I noticed at the very end when you had both the host and the parasite predators, there was a slight reversal in the trend. They had a little bit less uh, infections with the salt. And I was wondering if they tried to explain that or what was going on, maybe something with the predator susceptibility or what, what's up? Yeah, so I, I know exactly which slide you're talking about. It's funny, I've, I've, I've seen that data so so many times now. So um, in that uh, one uh, response, we found that they both overlap. So you're right that there is a slight increase and there is a slight flip. But when we think about it statistically, it's it's not uh, significant. So. Oh, okay. I think we've lost her. Jessica, are you here? Oh no! Ah, you returned. That was interesting. <laughs> Campus I internet. Think, what's that? Campus internet. Oh, no. Um, yeah, that is interesting. Now, okay, so it's not statistically significant. My guess was just like maybe the predators were also affected by the salt or something else. But I was curious. Could be. Um, the predator. So I, I should mention that for the, the, the dragonfly, it was just the smell. So it was just water of the, of the dragonfly. Oh, that's true. So likely, it may not be affecting that organism. And then also, the salt wouldn't have affected the damselfly because in the arena, there was no salt. The tadpoles are exposed to salt, then moved to clean water. Oh. So we think it's just, um, it's just uh, some variation in, in some of the effects. And that's why you have the air bars. And they overlap, overlap dramatically, so we, we don't think that there is much of a difference. Now, uh, if we run it again, we find a, them separating out more. So, for example, we only use one gram per liter. If we had more salt, then perhaps uh, that might be something to follow up on. Okay. Um, so I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the, the conclusion the broad conclusion that, that you reach from these, the invasive research that, that sort of invasive species beget invasive species. Mm -hmm. uh, like, is this like long-term evolutionary trends? Like, is this perhaps just how evolution works that, you know, continents collide and species come in and, and suites of adaptations change? Or 
Um, like, can we can we assign value judgments onto this, or is it just a dynamic? Um, so I think to answer that question, I'll speak first a little bit more about the invasional meltdown hypothesis, and and the idea is that uh, why why are why are some species invasive, and and they're invasive because they're able to tolerate various conditions. So that that means they can tolerate stressful contaminant conditions. They can tolerate herbivores. They can tolerate predators better than the native species. And so um, the idea is that when you have an invader coming in, it often brings certain things with it that might be harmful to the environment. And if it's harmful to the environment and another invasive species comes in, then that invasive species is already at a distinct advantage because it can outcompete the other ones because it has traits that allows it to better compete in those stressful environments. So the idea is that um, they, they all, there's a reason they are invasive and it's because they're tolerant to, to stressful conditions and they create stressful conditions for, for the area. And so should we assign judgment values? Is that what was your question? Yeah, well, you know, so, so we see these, these different invasive species coming in, right? And there's, there's mm -hmm. some sort of like conservationist in me that wants to say like, oh, you know, we need to keep our environments pristine, right? Or, you know, this like abstract sense of purity, right? And then on the other hand, I look at these evolutionary dynamics as well. Adaptation is when, when you have you know, things that are better adapting to their environments. And it's just, there are adaptations that evolved in Africa and now, they're reaching their ways to North America and and like would the result be in five million years that just like you know things are more fit I mean like I like it, it's difficult to to say this without making, making I, I, problematic generalizations but I don't know, I don't know. Question. Um, actually, actually the, 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 oh sorry um, so, so there's a, th there has been a huge debate. Uh, there's actually a New York Times article. Who cares about invasive species? It is just ad adaptation, right? Like, let the, let the survival of the fittest go, and, and, and that is the way it should go. And then you get the other camp, which argue, well, invasive species are only there because of human activities. And so in that sense, it's, are we artificially shifting evolution in one way versus the way it would naturally happen? And then again, the question is, does it matter? So I think it matters when you consider what matters to us as humans. So let's say economically, we, we, we bring something in that ruins some industry. Then I think you can assign judgment value. But it, I think it, it's all, it all depends on what we value as humans, ultimately. Ecologically, I say, let whatever come, come and the best will come out of it. But zebra mussels, you know, thinking about that and how it has affected industry, I, I think it's much harder. And that's why I will collaborate with an economist one day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a quick question, um, kind of related to what you're talking about, like how man-made impacts affect um, the natural environment and kind of like how to sort of maintain that balance of like human impact and also that kind of pristine ecology. And I'm kind of curious, like what are some of those big uh, stakes, like those ecological or environmental stakes that these types of research and toxicology reports can kind of mitigate? Um, and like, what are potential solutions? So what are the main, you know, fears or consequences of invasive species or these high levels of salt in the water? Um, and then what are potential solutions? Like, I don't know if there's a different type of salt or a different type of road treatment that can be used, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we'll start with road salts and, and I'll talk a little bit about what are the issues? So obviously, if we don't have road salt in the winter, that, that really affects productivity. People can't drive to work, things like that. But on the other end, if we have this salt contamination, we lose biodiversity, we lose the uh, function of wetlands. Wetlands protect us from a variety of different things. So there's also economic issues there. Now, you can also then think about uh, different solutions, right? So um, one solution to using road salts would be to use uh, B 
beet juice. So beet juice can also be useful, but the thing is like, it, it requires somebody to innovate. It requires somebody to figure out how to make it as effective as salt without, and, and also understanding that it may not be toxic, but there is no incentive. Until there is an incentive to, um, to innovate, it's, it's, it's likely not going to happen. Now, um, there's something that you guys may or may not be familiar with. Um, fracking is illegal in uh, New York. But what is legal is we can take fracking brine, the toxic radioactive crap that comes out of uh, fracking wells, and we can spread it on our roads. And, and that radioactive contaminant can leach into the aquatic systems, but it's not regulated because it is considered road salt. So there are other alternatives, some potentially better than others, but it's also really challenging for regulation or regulating agencies to figure out which is which and what to do and what is better and is it better. So road salt, that's my answer for the road salts. <laughs> Uh, wait, can you talk um, about how, why the wetlands are so important and how the types of species that live there kind of help um, maintain that, that, that wetland environment? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll answer this question from a human point of view, and then I'll answer it from an organism point of view. So for humans, wetlands are absolutely critical to protect us from contaminants. They, so they serve as a filter. So when, when you get rainwater, um, you get a lot of um, toxic chemicals trapped in wetlands, which then protects the water as it goes to human use, human consumption, things like this, bit bigger water bodies. It also helps to prevent flooding. So they absorb a lot of the water. Um, so that's really important there. Um, there's also huge recreation um, purposes of wetlands, so waterfowl, um, beauty, uh, you know, uh, you have hiking. So those are some of the, the human side of things. Um, the organism side of things, it is one of the, you may not realize it, but one of the most diverse types of uh, ecosystems. There are so many organisms that depend solely on wetlands. Um, you have amphibians that are hugely diverse. Uh, you have birds that, that migrate that depend on wetlands to um, overwinter. Um, and you lose one part of that, that ecosystem and, and it can have cascading effects. So um, that's uh, originally what I posed. Like, you know, who cares if you lose two amphibian species? We don't know unless we consider how if you remove one of those, what else gets hurt by it? Um, so I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about the the art and outreach work that you were doing. So you talked about uh, a show that you did, and then your presentation itself had these really lovely frog illustrations. Um, what? So I guess the, to, to to ask a, a, the the short question would be like, what what are you doing with the art that you are making, and what do you hope to do with it? Right. Um, so the, the goal right now, so the first two art shows were sort of a pilot. It's a, it's a lot of work to do to do that art show. And so we want to know first, how, how can we make it the most effective? So that was what the assessments were for. And then um, how can we, uh, what, what is it that we're actually doing um, in this art show? So the goal is eventually, uh, we think that art can really capture the attention of people that uh, are getting into, get, or just starting to get interested in uh, diversity, so I, we think that that might be around third to fifth grade. So the goal is eventually to bring it into the classrooms just to teach about uh, these interactions and then um, to demonstrate that it's, it's worth the teacher's time. We'll have this data set to show them, look, it, it can change the way people think. And then I think if we start at a young enough age, it's foundational. I think that that carries throughout the life of, of that, 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 that individual. And that's what we hope to do. Um, I, I am also very, a very optimistic person, <laughs> so we'll see. Um, but uh, the short answer to your question is, it is currently uh, the artist sitting in my office. <laughs> uh, do you have files that you could send the class so that we can use some of those illustrations in the videos that we're making? Yeah, I can. Oh, I first have to ask my, my artist, um, but I'm sure that he'd be very, very happy to, to share them. Cool. 
make sure to email me about that. Okay, yeah, I, I will do that right right as, as soon as we, we finish this. I will I'll send an email about that. Hi, I have a question about um, like invasive species in general. Um, I was wondering, so we talked about like invasive species that enter the environment and like are more adaptive, like have an adaptive advantage in that environment because they're maybe more like rigid, I don't know how to describe it, like more hardy. But say, just hypothetically, species comes in and doesn't really have an adaptive advantage. Um, I'm trying to figure out maybe like a fish, they call it a goby in freshwater rivers up upstate um, near where I live in Syracuse. And they are an invasive species and they do cover and they eat a lot of um, other eggs from fish nests, but I don't know how much of an impact they have, like if it's greater than other fish or if they've caused an extinction, extinction uh, of like another species. So I was just wondering, like maybe auxiliary effects of like an inv invasive species. So auxiliary effects of invasive species, that's a, that's a interesting question. So I think we have to answer that question first with what it means to be invasive. Um, you, can, you can have, there are different categories. Um, so they are uh, non-native species that, that get in, but they have to establish. Once they establish, then the next step is that they have to have a negative effect. Once they have a negative effect, then they would be called invasive. And then at that point, we make a decision on economically, what can we do? What are the costs and benefits of removing this invasive species? And, and does it really outweigh the effect that it's having? And actually, what's interesting is some people are finding that the best option is to do nothing. Eventually, things come around, and you know, if an invasive species is competitive, I mean, these native species also have the opportunity to re -compete, uh, compete again. So if we actually are just patient, um, it, perhaps it works itself out. But tell that to, I don't know, uh, an industry worker or a farmer that, that really, really depends, his livelihood, her livelihood depends on that, that resource. So patience may not always be the best, uh, even if it's an auxiliary effect. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate like the economic standpoint, like the way of looking at it, how nature will likely return to homeostasis or I guess like, uh, regulate itself over time because of the amount of factors involved. So I appreciate that. Thank you. No, no problem. I've got a question concerning uh, the pesticide situation. Um, Usually, from what I've read, pesticides work by attacking like this, uh, the exoskeleton or something in insects. So I was a little confused how um, how it's toxic to amphibians and like what the mechanism is where they can get hurt by it and how they can get resistant to it. And I, I saw that you guys went into like the potential mechanisms of the interactions with the, the parasites and stuff, but I'm I'm like. Do you, do you guys know about why it actually hurts the, the amphibians, the pesticides? Yeah, so uh, pesticides, insecticides are, are interesting. Um, so you have the first insecticides, which are things like DDT. These are organochlorines, and, uh, and, and they were super toxic and they persisted. And then we developed something called the, the organophosphates, and, and these break down rapidly. They're what we call acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. So what they do is they, they target the, the neuron system. So you have the interneuron, the, the muscular junction. So you have uh, acetylcholine esterases that break down acetylcholine. But what these insecticides do is they mimic that, 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 that they, they enter into the acetylcholine esterase. So they can't break down the esterases. So what happens is the nerves are continuously firing uh, because they can't shut off. The esterases are inhibited. And as a result, over time, they just like, it's sort of like a twitching thing. And then they'll, they'll become paralyzed and then eventually their energy reserves will run out and that's what causes them to uh, experience mortality. Now ways that they become tolerant, um, they can evolve to increase the amount of esterases produced or um, you, can, you can make your target site a little less, just shift it a little bit so that the pesticides don't bind, but your acetylcholine can still bind, and that way function can continue. So that's one way that they can become tolerant. But all of those different mechanisms require a lot of energy. So if you have all that energy involved, then, I mean, you're not going to have as much as many resources to deal with avoiding a parasite. Um, uh, 
purging the parasite if you get infected. So we think that might be some of the mechanisms associated with uh, the, the tolerance that we find. So is the, the neural, the acetylcholine neural pathway, is that the same in invertebrates and vertebrates that, that the chemical disrupts? Yes, it, it is an, it's an esterase. Um, so this is the, the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. So because it, it can't properly break down acetylcholine, the acetylcholine continues to go to the next neuron, which causes it to, to fire and, and just doesn't stop. So I, so that's, I didn't realize that. I mean, I thought that the way that these companies designed these chemicals initially is like they wanted to find molecules that, that had, had a desired effect on, on organisms that were not very similar to humans, right? You want it to be toxic to, to the, the lepidoptera that are eating the corn, but you don't want it to be toxic to the humans that are eating the corn. Right, you're, you're absolutely right. So um, you know how I mentioned we go from organochlorines to organophosphates. The next iteration of this are, are pyrethroids, and the next iteration of the insecticides are the neonicotinoids. So neonicotinoids are specific towards insects, but what's really interesting is that these neonicotinoids can be just as toxic it just, to bees, for example. So it, it it inevitably happens that we try to, to create things that break down faster that are more specific, but for every insecticide that we've ever created, organisms have evolved tolerance to. There's at least been one case. And what's, what's interesting is that um, it's, it's like no matter what we do to shift it, it is still in effect. So, so there's there's the problem of organism tolerance, but it, what about the that specificity issue? Like, is it do we actually have chemicals that are specific, or do you always see that there are these like these side effects, ecological side effects that that undermine our claims of like, oh yeah, this is just going to get the corn borer moths? I would argue, um, and this is my personal um, belief, that there there's nothing that's specific to one pest. Mm. You think about uh, there, think about the tree of life. Everything is uh, related to something. So if one is a pest, then a closely related species likely has the same physiological mechanisms that allow it to, to live. And so I, I think um, it's just not realistic to think that we can develop something. But again, it, it really all boils down to our population, our human population is growing. We need these contaminants, not contaminants, we need these tools um, from an economics perspective to maintain our, our population. So it, it truly, we really need to start collaborating, thinking about what the costs and what the benefits are. I, I think it's better than it used to be. I mean, think about DDT, right? That's, that was really horrible. We're still, a lot of our vegetables are still contaminated with DDT. So it's better, I wouldn't say it, I don't think that we've come to the right solution. Um, organic farming, there are, all, there are also pesticides used in, in, in that setting that may or may not um, be just as bad. Uh, it really just depends. But I don't want to be this to be a doom and gloom. I do want to say that truly, like it just we need people to to know about this information and to innovate. I, that's that's all. That's the purpose of this: educating people, getting people to care, and then the next step is pushing people to use their backgrounds. And, and in every case, humans have innovated a way out of most any issue that we've encountered. Yeah. Well, so that was that was one question I wanted to ask you: is what what got you into this, and like what what motivates you to keep doing this research? Um, yeah. What got me into this? That's an interesting thing. So when I was in college, uh, I only went to college to play sports. I didn't um, know what I was doing, but I knew that I wanted to continue to play basketball. So yeah, I did that. And then biology was something that my parents wanted me to do. And I was like, sure, whatever, I'm good at memorizing stuff. And I can be a doctor. To be a doctor, you have to take MCATs and ensure that you do research, which is the most artificial, superficial thing. The reason why I got into research, but I did that and found out that I really, I mean, research is pretty darn cool. Like you get to, I think it's the best job. I, you get to choose what you do. You get to choose who you work with. You have no boss. Um, you get to do things that you think are important. Every day is different. And, and that, uh, it's, it's also really addicting to find results. 
because then uh, you get to, to dive deeper into it. So I think that's what really kept me in it. But uh, getting into it, I don't think my story is typical. I got, I truly believe I got really lucky and I met really good people along the way. Um, well, are there, are there any final questions for Jessica before we conclude the class? Uh, there's a couple of people that have been silent. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for this talk. It was, it was a lot of really great information. Um, and I will, I will make sure to, to send you links to the stuff that we make. And yeah, I mean, those, those illustrations would be wonderful. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about the video that I want to make and you know, having, having those frog pictures would be, would be really, really splendid. I know, I know Ben would be on board, but I will ask him anyway. Cool. All right. Uh, well, thanks once again. And yeah. Those, those illustrations would <laughs> <laughs> it's an online class, and uh, <laughs> so so there are glitches and whatnot. No, it was really weird to give a lecture to to, to the screen. <laughs> yeah, you, you get no feedback. No, I'm like, oh my god, I was checking my phone. You guys don't know it, but I was checking my phone for email. I was like, oh my god, am I still talking to somebody? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, anyway, well, but thank you for having me. It was it was a pleasure. I think you guys had great questions, and uh, if you have more, feel free to email. Cool. All right. Um, so I will stop the broadcast when Jessica leaves, and as usual, I'll check in with the class for a few minutes, and then we will. All right. See you guys. All right. Bye. -bye. Broadcast.